Good morning. I'm Fred Taylor from Discovery Baptist Church, and I'm going to be reading the scripture this morning. Um, I'll give you time to look your scriptures up so you can follow along with me if you wish. And our scripture reading this morning will be from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. While I give you a chance to look up that scripture verse, um, I just wanted to take some time to extend our sincerest sympathies to the Florence Schmulen family from both Faith Baptist Church and Discovery Baptist Church. She was known to us at uh, Discovery uh, as well as she attended many functions that we held there for uh, her and her friends. If you're ready, we will read those scripture verses now. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices, and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning and welcome to our broadcast this morning as we'll be looking at the book of Colossians today, going back to a series of messages that we started uh, some time ago and we're working our way through the book of Colossians when the pandemic hit. And so now I want to go back and pick up where we left off. So this morning we'll be looking at Colossians chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, turn there with me if you would please. Thank Fred uh, from Discovery Baptist for sharing the scripture this morning. And we just want to pause for a moment to ask the Lord's blessing on our time as we look into what God's word has to say to us today from Colossians chapter 3. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we have to gather by way of internet to uh, consider your word, to look into it. We pray, Lord, as we do so, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher here today. That, Lord, uh, you would open our hearts and our minds to the truth of your word. And, Lord, as you convict us, we pray, Lord, that uh, our hearts would be pliable in your hands and that your will would be accomplished in our lives. We give you the praise and the glory for all that you'll do this day now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. This morning I want to begin by talking to you about uh, what we have here is a spiritual hypothesis. And if you think back to your years in school, you'll remember that a hypothesis has three major parts. The first is a cause. We have a cause. It's usually represented in a statement as this, like if the car is running, I can drive to town. So the, the cause would be that the car is running and it, with following the cause there is an effect. Effect. 
in that example, if, if the car's running, then I can go to the grocery store and get groceries. The, the effect would be that I would be able to uh, transport myself to the grocery store. And then there is finally a rationale. Rationale, reasons for it, because the car is taking me for, to, the, to the grocery store, therefore I can gather what I need. Here today in this passage, Paul presents us with a spiritual hypothesis. One in which the qualifier or the cause is the statement, if you were raised with Christ. I want to make this very clear this morning that this is absolutely important. If you do not have the cause, if there's no cause, in other words, if you have not been raised with Christ, then there can be no effect and there can be no rationale. You first must begin by identifying with the fact that you have been raised with Christ. The things that Paul has to say here this morning about those who are raised with Christ is only for those who have been saved. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then the things that Paul has to share in the following verses do not apply to you. This is for believers. Now, having said that, Let's consider for a moment what it is to be saved. What do we mean by that? Oftentimes I think we, we speak in our Christianese and people don't really understand what we mean by that. Even some people who have attended church for many, many years don't always understand what it means to be saved. So I want to explain that this morning before we move on into this passage because if you don't meet that qualifier, then the rest of the things that I have to share this morning are of no value to you. To be saved simply means to have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. Take your Bibles, if you will, and I want to walk you through how it is that one is saved. This is something that I think is important for those of you who are believers because you can use this uh, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with friends and loved ones. It's imperative for those of you here who are listening today and watching on, online, it's imperative for those of you who have never accepted Jesus Christ to understand what this is so that you might be saved. I believe during this time there are many people who are searching. They're looking. And folks, I want to tell you the answer is found in Jesus Christ. And this is, if you will, the steps we need to go through to bring ourselves to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So uh, the, the, the first uh, thing that we want to look at this morning with regard to being saved is something that we read in the book of Romans. So if you take your Bibles and turn to Romans, and we're going to want to look at the third chapter and the 23rd verse. Okay, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. And once you get into the book of Romans, you can stay there because we're just going to walk right through Romans, looking at what this powerful book has to say to us about being saved. Verse 23 says that, uh, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This verse points out to us what our problem is. The problem is that every one of us, no matter who you are, no matter uh, what family you're born to, no matter what eco economical uh, group you might be part of, no matter what uh, race you might be from, no matter anything, you have sinned. We all have sinned. That, I've often said that three-letter word, A-L-L, -L, is one of the most significant verses in all of Scripture. All, when we look at it, we study that word, we come to realize that all means exactly that. Everyone, without exception. There's no one other than Jesus Christ himself who has ever walked this earth, who did not face this problem, the problem of sin. Now, if I were to sit down with you personally and ask you, can you identify a time when you sinned? You know, I've had occasion to share this with many, many people over the years. Of all the literally hundreds of people that have shared this with, I've never had one person say, no, I, I, I never sinned. <laughs> I never sinned. 
You remember last week I told you about uh, Brother Lester and how he came to Christ. Uh, that was the first thing that he had to realize is that we have a problem and that problem is sin and, and sin has caused us to be separated from God. We see that in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 where here we see the penalty the penalty of our sin. Turn a page or two over to Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. It says here, for the wages, we all pretty much understand what a wage is. That's what I earn. You know, we all work at jobs. We go and we put in our time, and because of the time that we put in, we earn a wage. Well, the wage that I have earned, the wage that you have earned through our sin is death. That is separation from God. Eternal damnation and ex an eternal existence in hell. Folks, we need to come to that place where we understand that, that we have a problem. It's our sin and that the penalty for that sin is separation from God. That verse goes on and says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Turn to... Uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, right across the page from where you're at. Romans 5 and verse 8. And here we, we see the payment for our sin, or some might say the provision for our sin. Verse 8 of Romans 5 says this, But God demonstrated his own love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated his agape love for you and for me in a time when we were still sinners, before we repented of our sin, before we turned to Christ, God demonstrated his love for us in that his son, Jesus Christ, died in our place. Friends, if we are to be saved, we need to realize that we're a sinner. We need to realize that what we've earned is death. And we need to realize that Jesus Christ has made the payment of that. The next passage I want you to look at is in Romans chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. And this is where we have a profession. A profession. Look there, if you will, with me, verse, beginning in verse 9 of chapter 10. He says, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Here we see that a major part of what we're to do is to confess. What does it mean to confess? Well, that means that I basically admit that I am a sinner. I profess that. And secondly, he says, I need to believe. Believe. That's, that, that has to do with my understanding that Jesus Christ died for me. I need to believe that he is the Son of God. I need to believe that his death on the cross paid my penalty. I need to confess and believe. Then verse 10 goes on and says this, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Here we see that with the heart we believe, the heart we believe. This goes beyond just an understanding of the fact of what happened, but believing in my heart, in my mind, if you will, that Jesus Christ died for me. And then he goes on and he says in verse 10, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So uh, our mouth, the words that we say, uh, lead us to, through to confession. And that's how we're saved. So to put it all together, I realize that I have a problem, that's sin. I understand that what I've earned because of my sin is a penalty, death, separation from God for all of eternity. And 
I acknowledge that the payment of that sin has been made by Jesus Christ because God loved me. Not because I did anything, not because I'm worthy of it, but because of his love. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says it this way, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's nothing I can do to earn that. It's an act of God's grace. Being a member of a church, uh, being baptized, giving money to uh, the church in our offerings, uh, serving the community, none of those things save us. It's only God's grace and by us placing our faith in, in Jesus Christ that we are saved. We see then that the payment was made on our behalf. We need to profess that. We need to profess that. And that profession means simply this, that I, I make a mental decision, first of all, that the way I was living my life was wrong and I repent of that. I turn away from it and go an entirely different direction. I, I am admitting to God that my way of living life was wrong and your way is right and I'm going to do the best I can through the power of the Holy Spirit to live my life for you. Confessing that, making, with your mouth actually saying that to our Lord and Savior. That's what it is to be saved. Back to Colossians chapter 3 then, where... The Apostle Paul says, if then you were raised with Christ, if you have died, I mean, if you have been saved, then you died with Christ. Now that's, that's a, uh, a, a statement that sometimes we don't exactly understand, that we've died with Christ. And I've had people ask me from time to time, what, what does that mean, I've died with Christ? What that is saying is that Jesus died in my place. He took my place. He is a substitutionary death for me. Jesus died on the cross paying my penalty. So in essence, I died with him on the cross. Turn to Galatians um, chapter 2 and verse 20. Galatians are just a few books back from where we are in Colossians. 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, chapter 2 and verse 20, where the Apostle Paul uh, explains this. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, Jesus Christ took our place on the cross of Calvary, and we died with him some 2,000 years ago. He rose again from, from the grave and he lives now interceding at the right hand of God for you and I. And because he rose, we have that life as well and our life is in Christ. That's what Paul is saying here in Colossians. If you have done that, if you have been raised with Christ, if you've been saved, then there's some things I want to tell you. There's some things you need to understand. I want to ask you this morning, have you accepted Jesus Christ? Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? If you don't today, you can place your faith in him right now at this very moment. And I encourage you to do that. And if you have questions about that, please contact us. We'd love to talk to you about how you can know you're born again. How you can know what it is to be saved. And you can apply these truths that we find in Colossians to your own life. So we see here that Paul gives us a spiritual hypothesis in which the clause, or the cause rather, is that if you have been raised with Christ, then there are some things that should be true. Notice, if you will, in verse 1, he says, seek those things which are above. This word seek is an interesting word in that uh, it it is an aorist word. And what do we mean by that? Well, it's an aorist tense. And the significance of that is it tells us when we are to seek. And the aorist tense is something that is unique to the Greek language. We don't have an English equivalent. But 
the best way we can explain it is that it, it began at a point in time, and that point in time would be when you accepted Jesus Christ, and it's something that continues to go on in your daily life. So uh, it, it could, could be translated seek and continue to seek. Now the word seek itself is used only one other place. Uh, excuse me, that's not right. I've got the wrong word. It's, it's used in a couple of places that I think we want to look at that would help us to understand. Uh, I will also say that it's, it's an imperative. It's an uh, imperative. Meaning that it's a command. We don't have an option. It's something we are to do. Turn to Luke chapter uh, Chapter 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 15. Luke 15, we find the parable of, first of all, the lost sheep. And the situation here is that uh, a shepherd who has a hundred sheep has lost one of them. And what does he do? He goes out and seeks the lost. Look in verse 4 of chapter 15 with me. What man of you having a hundred sheep... If he loses one, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. That is seeking. This man, this shepherd, leaves the 90 and 9 and goes out seeking for that lost sheep. Now when he goes out looking for that lost sheep, he's going to use every possible resource that he can to find that sheep. He's going to go out and continue to look for it until he finds it. Skip down a few verses to chapter 8. Here we see another parable that Jesus has shared with us where a woman has lost her silver coin. She had 10 silver coins. She's lost one. In verse 8 it says, or what woman having Ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search. And that's the same word in, in the Greek as the word used in Colossians. Carefully until she finds it. What's she going to do? She's going to, she'll move everything out of that house if she needs to. Sweep the floor, sweep the corners until she finds that coin. Paul is telling us here when we are to seek Seek those things which are above. There is to be effort put into it. We are to pursue after those things until we find them. It's not just simply taking a glance around to see if we can find it or if it's there. You know, quite often Randall will say to me, will you, will you go and get this out of the refrigerator? And I go and I open the refrigerator and I, I look and I say, it's not there and I close the refrigerator. She goes over and she opens it and reaches in and takes it right out. You see, many of us think that seek is what I was doing when I looked in the refrigerator. That's not the case. Seek, if I was truly seeking what she sent me for, I would stay there until I found it. I would move everything out of that refrigerator if necessary to find that item that I'm looking for. Paul is saying we need to seek those things which are above. Seek those things. Secondly, he says then in verse 2, he says that we are to set our minds on things above, not on things on the earth. This is the phrase I was thinking of earlier that is only used one time, one other time in Scripture <clears throat> in the New Testament. And we find that in uh, Philippians chapter 2. Turn back towards the front of your Bible a couple of pages to the book of Philippians chapter 2. And look with me, if you will, at verse 5. Where he says, let this mind be in you. That phrase, let this mind be in you, is the same, same uh, Greek words that are translated set your mind on in Colossians. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Hey, we are to have our mind set on these things. There needs to be a purpose. It needs to be a driven purpose to set our minds on the things of heaven. It means to uh, be earnest and to be set in a particular direction. What are the things that we are set to be set on? What are those things from above? Well, Paul gives us a, a list of them there in Philippians as he continues talking about uh, 
Christ and who he is. And then in chapter 4, he tells us specifically what some of those things are that we should set our mind upon. Look at verses 8 and 9. He says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true... When he says whatever things are true, he's saying those things that are not concealed or hidden but are open and revealed as the truth. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. When Paul says to set our mind on things above, this is what he's talking about. Set your mind on those things that are above. Think about those. Be driven towards those things in that direction. Verse 9 goes on and says, The things you have learned and received and heard and saw on me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Hey, here he's saying, Paul is saying, Seek after these things and the things that you've seen in me. The example that have been to you. Do those things as well in your life. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul kind of echoes this, this same thought. Chapter 11 and verse 1. No, that's not the verse I wanted. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians must be 2 Corinthians 11. 1. Oh, no. 1 Corinthians 11. 1. Here it is. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Paul is saying there, hey, I've been an example to you. Follow after me. What a high mark Paul has set there. I often wonder myself, could I honestly say that to other Christians? Could I say to you, imitate me as I have imitated Christ? Could you say to me, imitate me, as I have imitated Christ. We must to be able to say that as Paul did. We must be set on those things above. Not the things on the earth. This is what Paul is telling us. Now, as I look at this list of things that Paul has told us that we're to do. Setting our minds and seeking those things above. It seems to me those are not easy things to do. This is difficult. And in our own strength, we won't be able to do this. And that's why Paul begins by saying, if you then have been raised in Christ, the only way we can accomplish this is if we are a believer and our strength comes from him. Philippians 4.13 tells us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We can set our minds on those things above if, if we know Christ. He will give us the strength. He'll give us the ability to do that. Paul goes on then and he, he tells us why it's important for us to set our minds on things above and to seek after those things which are above. He tells us uh, in verse 4, or excuse me, verse 3, he says, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Hey, listen, we should do this because we're no longer our own. We have, we have died to self, and we have uh, been raised to life in Christ. And we are now to live for him. He goes on in verse 4 and says, When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. What a wonderful truth we have here. Jesus Christ died and paid the penalty of our sin. He rose again victorious over death. And uh, he is now sitting at the right hand of God, interceding for you and for me. And when he appears, we will appear with him in glory. And this is the promise that we have from God's word. The promise that you and I will have eternal life. That we will spend eternity with Jesus. In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, Christ addresses this very point. He says, Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. 
Folks, when we have been raised with Christ, when we've been saved, we set our minds on things above. We seek after those things of God because our life is in him, because of the, of the tremendous price he paid to give us salvation, and because we will appear with him in glory one day. He's coming again. Do you know him this morning? Have you placed your faith in him? Are you setting your minds on things above? This is, this is so important. And Paul will then take and shift gears a little bit and talk about how we are to put off the old man and put on the new man. We can't do that if we haven't been seeking the things above, if we haven't set our mind on things above. Next week we'll look at the old man and the new man and how that has impacted our lives and how we can have victory in this life as we live for Jesus Christ. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and goodness to us. We thank you for your plan of salvation and we thank you, Lord, that uh, through Jesus Christ we can have the power to do the things we're unable to do in our own strength. I pray, Lord, as we go throughout this week that you would enable us to seek those things which are above, to truly be focused on the things that, that you would have us to be focused on, not concerned with the things of the world, but set on the things that you have put before us. And Lord, might our minds be set on doing those things. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.